All right, here we go, guys. Melanie and Suzanne, are you guys all ready in the back? Awesome. All right, well, good morning, everyone. For those of you that are watching online, we are having our brunch. This is Pastor Howard's plate uh, that I got to fix uh, with all the goodies that are in the back. So if you're on your way and haven't had breakfast, just run on in. We have more than enough food. Um, but one of the things, or a few things that I just want to talk to you about today, um, as we have Palm Sunday today, so happy Palm Sunday. And for those of you that are getting ready for Holy Week, you've got your set of um, um, traditional things that you do with family and with friends and all that while we get to eat as we work our way through Easter. I just pray that this is a great start to a new week. I, I pray this all the time. But as we consider it being Palm Sunday and the fact that um, Jesus was in a body with flesh and already having to deal with, you know, I would think it would be somewhat of an inconvenience, but because of the love that he has for us, he was looking forward to what we're celebrating today and the things that are following, that will follow afterwards. And I think about the celebration and how people were excited. They were looking for a way out. They were looking for relief and maybe this guy was the answer and he always was, but not in the way that they thought. And I just think so many of us walk through life really struggling or feeling under absolute attack if it's not physical, you know, emotional, it's mental. And we talk about this every week because it's so prevalent in this day and age with, with the things that are going on all around us. And it just gets crazier with technology and all of that. It just means that we have to reinvent ourselves in how we function, but function properly through the process. So I think the fact that we're going into Palm Sunday, you think it's going to be, you know, this happy time, but you know, it's dark. It is real dark. There's death, there's suffering, but you know what? There's new life in the morning. And that's when we come back next week for Easter and we get to celebrate that and remember what our Lord did for us. And the fact is, you know what? Whether you're here, you have Jesus with you. Whether you're in heaven, you have Jesus with you. You know why? Because you're his. And so if you've made that commitment to him, don't be discouraged. Be encouraged with just the life that he's given you, the opportunities, seize hold of those opportunities. When we think of Hebrew, Hebrews, uh, the cloud of witnesses, uh, yeah, the cloud, Hebrews 12, you know, the testimony, those people were just like us. They struggled. They were weak. They had bad thoughts. They did bad things. They didn't always do what they were supposed to do. But you know what? That's the Lord's faithfulness. So let's remember that today. Be encouraged with that. I know um, one of the things, uh, when it comes to your kids, today. Uh, let's see if we have that. Okay. This is the kids craft today. So for those of you watching online, if you guys want to repeat this with your children, there is a verse that goes with it. And I think the guys have it, but it's Matthew 21, nine. And it's when they're all celebrating, singing Hosanna and actually worshiping God the way he was meant to be worshiped. But what a fleeting moment, but we get to do that forever. And I want to share that with those kids. Last year, I had to up the game, the ante, because last year I get, I, I got a little creative. Um, in a way that might not have been the best, but we had donations of yardsticks. And what we did is we made paper fan palm, or prawns and we stapled them to the sticks and we just kind of just did the palm thing. Well, I did hear the stories of the way on the drive home and the things that happened and occurred while the kids were fanning each other, except they weren't just fanning each other when they got home. So I had to come back with something else and a little different. So I hope that the kids enjoy it. I pray that you guys, if, you, if you're online or you don't have, you want to have an opportunity to do this with the kids, I can set that stuff aside for you and make sure that it's ready. All right, so as you know, we have our Palm Sunday brunch there's food if you'd like to go up there through the service you know just be mindful because there are people back there so if you haven't gotten it yet and you want to run up real quick that's not a problem there'll be more than enough food afterwards so don't panic if you're not hungry just yet and you're just waking up um, when it comes to this week we typically have a good friday service and because like we've said this is a shared space we will not be having a service that evening i know one of the things that we've done that's been successful is have howard pastor howard pray about about it and um, deliver some sort of message that can be um, found on our web page and our social platform, uh, social platform, uh, media platform. So that way, if you need that little encouragement, you need a reminder, you need to be in the word, you need to be filled, whatever it is that you need for that Friday as we head into the weekend, especially as we get together with family and friends and celebrations and 
that start out good and then like a quinceanera at 11 o'clock at night, everything oh. start, yeah. You know how that goes <laughs> when the blows happen. So anyway, we'll be here online Friday, but we'll be back Sat or Sunday for Easter Sunday service. So we are going to be here. We hope to see you. And we're excited about this week coming up. All right, you know about Tuesdays, you know about Saturdays, Tuesday Bible study in person, Saturday morning prayer, 9 o'clock over the telephone. If you have any needs or concerns, if you have a need for a Bible, anything like that, please let us know because I know you're not always able to make it, but we can leave it here at the hub, at the front office. We can drop it off for you or you can pick it up at our home since most of you know where we live anyway. So that is an invitation for you. That's it for me when it comes to my personal announcements. We have um, not only we have a few things today. Um, we have Melanie who's in the back still talking because she's setting up and they're cleaning up and doing everything for you. But we wanted to let her know that we didn't forget about her. It was her birthday on Tuesday. So I just thought it would be really sweet if we sang her happy birthday. But I also want to up the, open up the forum. Is there anyone else here with a birthday that we've missed or coming up? Awesome. So we're also we're going to do that. So um, we're going to sing her happy birthday, and then I'll come back to you for just a second here on um, on something else I want to make a special announcement about as well. For those of you that are giving, once we go to our tithe uh, segment, our donations, you can donate throughout. You can do it with your Venmo. You can do it online. We should have a screen that's going to be up where you can actually. Um, score that, that QR code and, um, and do your donations that way. That way it's all private and things like that. I, I want that to be between you and the Lord. So um, just remember that those are up there. It should be up on the screen. And as soon as Pastor Howard's ready. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, just happy birthday for now. now. All right. How many would love to hear Lucia sing this solo this morning? Just by a show of hands. I'm telling you guys don't want that. I'm telling you. I'm not even a good dancer. I'm a good cyclist, though. Okay. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Jesus loves you. Happy birthday to you. All right. So um, happy birthday, Melanie. We love you and thank you for everything. And Josh and Jeff that are up there to make this possible with, our, with my little request on images and things. But um, we have... Um, Actually, you know what, there's someone we need to be praying for, and um, I, I want to bring that person up right now and with her support person. So I know this might seem kind of out of the ordinary, but Anna, would you come on up here in blue? Would you make sure, would you guys come on up here for a minute, please? Yeah, so as they make their way up here, for those of you that have been praying for Jason and Tanya, um, just undergoing surgery. They believe they may have gotten all the cancer out, so she's recovering. Thank you so much for all of those that have been so faithful in providing meals for them. They've been blessed, and I will keep you updated on what, what happens, but apparently they've gotten all the cancer, so we'll let you know exactly what's going on. So for Tanya and for Jason, but definitely they need prayer. And so right now, I don't know if you guys want to come up here um, a little closer. And I don't know if there's a mic maybe that I, Lou I, can I'm, kind of explain I'm loud, it. I'm loud enough. You're loud enough that we can hear it online? Okay, well, so well, I'm sorry. I'm sure that everybody on, online can hear you. So. Yeah, I guess I'm right there. Loud We're going to pray for you. <laughs> I know. Go ahead. It's going to uh, be this okay. This is our 18th wedding anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to fake tears. <laughs> and... Uh, and um, you, most of you guys know me, so this woman having to go through 18 years yeah. with this, pretty dang tough. Amen, Johnny. Uh, so I just wanted to, uh, <laughs> mission impossible, baby. So uh, Anna, I just wanted to, some of you know this, is from a song. If the sun, oh God, I'm going to turn into Lucia here for a second. <laughs> if the sun refused to shine. I would still be loving you. When mountains crumbled into the sea, there would still be you and me. My love for you is strong. With you there is no wrong. Together we shall go until we die. 
And so today, my world, it smiles. For your hand in mine, we walk for miles. Thanks to you, it will be done. For you to me, you're the only one. You could thank the philosophers Robert Plant and Jimmy Page for that. <laughs> <laughs> a little over 18 years ago, I saw you for the first time. You're an absolute beauty, and you still are. I would have never thought someone like you could love someone like me. Always by my side, even with all my imperfections. Lucia? There are 18 roses that represent the 18 best years of my life. Mm. God willing, and if you'll let me, I'll give you another 18. I love you, Bordeletta. <laughs> you know what? How about we, can we pray for them yeah. as well? Can we lay hands sure. and pray? That way I'm not an absolute liar. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, you know, this is just such a testimony. We all have histories and, and things that have gone down in the past, but when that right person comes in and just sets your world right side up, you know, it really does make a difference. And so we're so, so blessed with both of you. It's not just Anna. I think she's wonderful. Blue, I think you're amazing. And together, extraordinaire. So Here, Here's so. one crazy fact. Um, I met my wife... Uh, when I saw, that I saw her for the first time, she was in the choir at Oceanside Calvary, and I looked up on that stage and I said, that woman's gorgeous. Three months later, we were married. Oh. So she's earned every rose. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but uh, you know what? Um, we're going to go ahead and lift them up and just pray for their marriages and all those uh, the others here, and what a great testimony through all of it. Lord God, we just thank you so much for the amazing miracles, not just of you know, holding us together, but holding us together as partners, as husband and wife, Lord God. And just what a wonderful um, gift that that is and a picture and a testimony of how you work and how you function. And I just want to lift up Blue and Anna today, asking that you would bless them, Lord, that, that from this day forward, Lord, if they thought they had adventures then, back then, but Lord, you've got a whole new chapter and a whole new season of life for them. So Lord, would you lead them and direct them? Would you provide for them and strengthen them? Would you keep them whole and healthy, Lord God, that their bodies would be protected and shielded from the things that come, not only from the breakdown of just sin and just man, but from the pit of hell that wants to, that, that those things come out to just derail them. So Lord, as we pray for them, Lord, I pray that this would be something of a reminder for all of us, Lord, that it doesn't have to be easy. It shouldn't be because then <laughs> it's, maybe you're just missing out on something, but it takes work. But Lord, what fruit there is when we honor you with our relationship. So bless us and strengthen us. And more than anything, just bless the socks off, off this couple today. And may they have just a really, really sweet day together in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. You. You're welcome, honey. Oh. Yeah, you guys got me. Let's yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I tried to play it off as a gangster. I'm not as ba bad of a gangster as I used to be. All right, you guys, I'm going to get off the stage. We have the food up there, like I said. And thank you for sticking it out with us. If you're sitting here uh, watching live, just waiting for us to get started. I promise you it should be w worth your while. So thank you so much for hanging in there. I love you. And uh, God bless you guys. One thing set. Hello. Okay. Are you joining a period? No, I'm like, So somebody asked me, are, are we allowed to eat, like, are we supposed to eat, like, before or after, or is it okay during? And I just said yes. Repeat after me. Lord. You are good, and your mercy endures forever. Now you know the words. 
Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. Lord, you're good. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. People from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we worship you for who you are. You are good. You are good. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. Mean it. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. One more. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. People from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we worship you. This part's so easy. You are good all the time, all the time. You are good, you are good all the time, all the time. You are good. Lift it up. You are good all the time, all the time. You are good, you are good, all the time, all the time, you are good. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. People from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We worship you for who you are. We worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We worship you for who you are. Who you are. been a few centuries since I sang that song.
I've been thinking about Palm Sunday all week. And uh, there's, uh, you know, everybody gets really excited about Easter because, um, you know, it's obvious. Empty tomb, rose from the dead. That's, that's something to shout about, isn't it? But really something to think about when it comes to Palm Sunday is that everybody that was there, nobody saw it coming. But God planned on it. And I got to tell you, how many times in life have I wondered where God was when he was already there. And I want to be reminded that my trust needs to be firmly rooted and planted in him. This is a mellow old hymn. Are you ready? Oh, Lord, my God, in you I put my trust. Oh, Lord, my God, in you I put my hope. Oh, Lord, my God, in you I put my trust. Oh, Lord, my God, in you I put my hope. Oh, in you, in you I find my peace. In you, in you I find my strength. In you I live and move and breathe. Let everything I say and do be founded by my faith in you. Lift up holy hands and sing. Let the praises ring. Let the praises ring. Oh Lord my God, to you I give my hands. Oh Lord my God, to you. I give my feet oh Lord my God to you I give my everything oh Lord my God to you I give my life oh in you in you I find my peace Only oh, you, in you I find my strength. In you, in you I move and breathe. Let everything I say and do, founded by my faith in you. Let the holy hands and sing. Let the praises ring. Let the praises ring in you, in you, in you, I find my strength, my peace. In you, in you, I find my strength. I live and move and breathe. In you, I live and move and breathe. Let everything I say and do Founded by my faith in you Lift up holy hands and sing Let the praises ring Let the praises ring I'm going to take you back Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be the name of the Lord 
Blessed be the name of the Lord Most High. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord Most High. Sing glory to the name. Glory to the name of the Lord. Glory to the name of the Lord. Glory to the name of the Lord Most High. Glory to the name of the Lord. Glory to the name of the Lord. Glory to the name of the Lord Most High. We're going to bring it up. Holy is the name of the Lord. Holy is the name of the Lord. Holy is the name of the Lord. Most high, oh. holy is the name of the Lord. Holy is the name of the Lord. Holy is the name of the Lord. Most high, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Righteous run into it, and they are saved. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it, and they are saved. intoxicating is it not I have been living with Lucia's cooking for 36 years and you can eat your heart out she uh, is an amazing cook I can remember a meal that I received decades ago seriously I can remember one meal that I received from my wife decades ago. I'll explain it to you. It was tilapia. They call it St. Peter's fish. It's uh, native to the Sea of Galilee. I don't know if you knew that. But tilapia is a freshwater fish. It's a white fish, and it's not a fishy fish. It's a really nice fish. And if you cut loose... A Calabrian Italian woman on tilapia, great things happen. And she had cooked this tilapia, and I was reminding her of it just the other night. Angel hair pasta, little olive oil, some garlic. She threw down some green stuff, whatever that is. It doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Could have been weed for all I cared. It was that good. And then what she had done is poached it. After she would put a little sear there, she, she poached it. And then she gently laid down that filet of tilapia across the pasta. And let me just say, it was an oral experience. One that I will never forget leftovers now mom on the other hand in the home I grew up in leftovers were more like leftovers because she made a pot of something I googled it last year and found out it was a legitimate dish but I think my mom took liberties with the legitimate dish and she called it slumgullion now, I know that might sound weird to some of you, but she called it Slumgullion. I'd say, Mom, what are we having tonight? Slumgullion. 
Well, see, in our home, the Anderson home, we knew exactly what that meant. That meant that whatever she could find in the fridge got thrown in a pot and heated up. And, you know, I can say this about Lucia's tilapia. You let it sit in the fridge overnight with some wax paper or, or cling wrap over the top, and it gets better. But you leave mom's in the fridge with a little cellophane on the top, it gets worse. And I think some of us sometimes get the feeling that life has been delivering you nothing but a bad reheat of leftovers. God knows how to handle life. And whenever he would serve a leftover, it would be next level leftover. And if you've ever been in a point in your life where you're saying, and you're asking this question, God, where are you right now? Where are you here and now? You've been praying and you've been asking. You've been looking and searching and still no answer. If you're there, I have a meal for you today. Are you prepared? Yes. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew, the 21st chapter. We pause from our study through the book of John and we jump to Matthew because we're talking about the day that Jesus rolled into Jerusalem. And uh, I can tell you that right now it's a cruel thing that my wife has done. She's left the food under the pulpit so that I can stand here and just smell the aroma. So if I appear a little di bit distracted this morning, I am. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would bless this, our Bible study, that your hand would be upon our hearts and minds and eyes and ears, that we would be open to that which you have to say to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. We begin our study this morning. It's the Passover week. There's anywhere from two to two and a half million people in Jerusalem. So that we understand each other, so that you can get a topographical kind of a picture in your mind's eye, of Jerusalem, I looked it up. Get this, the city of Jerusalem's no bigger than Escondido. Can you imagine two million people down on the main streets of Escondido? Beyond the usual pilgrimage, there are citizens who live there. And now you can't drive, there's nowhere you can go. Because there's two million extra people in town. They would seriously slaughter about 250,000 sheep during this Passover season. The, the celebration was on. And you know when there's a bunch of people coming together, it's like a street fair on steroids. People are coming to make deals and to close deals, to sell and, and to buy. It was an event, to be sure. And I want you to know that Jesus has been putting together every nuance of life there in this day. His entrance is by no means a mistake. Verse 1. Now when they came, when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, 
Then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. Now there's groups of people here in Jerusalem. There were the Jews. Whenever you hear that, that usually means those people that were like rigid and stuck to the law of Moses. As a matter of fact, they had expanded on the law of Moses. Moses came out with Ten Commandments and they expanded it to well over 300. And so those were the people who were vying for their faith. They were fighting for the status quo. And this whole scene is anything but the status quo. Jesus has orchestrated every nuance of this day to teach us something about him. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I want you to think about this. He has historically told everybody that he ever did a miracle for, shh, don't tell anybody. When you get healed, don't tell anybody. And you know the biggest kicker of it all? The worst thing he could ever say is don't tell anybody. Because everybody that he healed went and told everybody. It's kind of like telling your kids, stay away from that cookie jar right there. I don't want you there. They, they would immediately go around and broadcast it. I want to read to you a few verses from just the previous chapter in Matthew 20, verses 29 through 34. Check it out. Listen. Now, as they went out of Jer Jericho, a great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men sitting by the road, when they heard that Jesus was passing by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. Then the multitude warned them that they should be quiet. But they cried out all the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. So Jesus stood still and called them and said, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him from that point on. I mean, there's no way out now. And guess what? He's going to end up in Bethany. And he's, he's on his way. And Lazarus, his good friend, has died, and he's going to roll into Bethany. He's going to ruin the funeral. Why? Because he's going to take the guest of honor and bring him back to life. Now, can you imagine two blind men on the Jericho Road and now Lazarus rising from the dead in Bethany? Boy, do you think that people are talking? I'm just asking a question. Do you? Absolutely. Word travels fast in Jerusalem there in the first century. Just as much as it travels here in, in Vista in the 21st century. And now Jesus, he's, he's got his laundry out there. I mean, he's not only out there, he's way out there. Oh Lord, son of David? This is mess messianic talk. This is Messiah talk. All of the disciples and everybody within earshot knew. They understood. And now this excitement is building and building on that Sunday. By the time he comes to Jerusalem... That capital city, I mean, jump down to verse 9. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. They're quoting from Psalm 118. They're actually singing the psalm. You know what Hosanna means? They're singing, save now, Lord. Hosanna, save us. Not in Galilee, not in Jericho, but in the capital city of Jerusalem. The crowd is shouting, and here he is. Jesus has purposely planned to put himself out there. Make no mistake, this is all by divine design. He's king, and the king is coming in your face. 
Do you, do you know what that means to us? Jesus. His name means Jehovah is salvation. Christ, Christos, that means the anointed one. So Jehovah is salvation, the anointed one is rolling into Jerusalem. And let me just say that he confronts us always. He's confronting Rome right now. But does Rome get it? No. They completely missed it. Why? Because they serve Caesar. They've got another God on their, uh, on their roster. And it's not the God of this Hebrew nation. But it's Caesar in Rome. And as far as they're concerned, I mean, nobody, no, no decent, no self-respecting Roman wants to be stationed in Jerusalem in the first century. They'd rather be on the Italian coast, maybe somewhere closer to home, maybe somewhere not quite so hot. Can you imagine how hot their armor got in the summertime at 120 degrees? My goodness. As far as they were concerned, they were indifferent to it, and they were stationed in the armpit of the Middle East. So he confronts the Jews. And the Jews are those who want to keep the status quo, and he's upsetting everything. He confronts them. He confronts the ordinary people. He confronts them. And he's literally saying, you can either crown me or kill me. The choice is up to you. Why? Because I'm more than just a savior. I am the chief shepherd, 1 Peter 5.4. I'm the one who's in charge. He confronts that world, and guess what? He confronts our world constantly, though we may not recognize it. He is king, and he confronts us with his kingdom. And you know what that takes me to a point that you need to really hear? He will not save what he cannot rule. He will not save what if he cannot rule. What he needs and what he's looking for are willing subjects to his kingdom. This is exactly why he wept over Jerusalem in Luke chapter 19. Verses 41 and 42. Listen to his cry, his prayer, his thought as he's looking over Jerusalem. If you had only known, even you especially in this, your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. In his mind and his heart, he knows they could have been protected. But see, that's what happens when Jesus confronts. He confronts us with the truth. Look at how he enters the city. Verse 6. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them and set them, him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. See, Jesus, here's the weird thing about this moment. He doesn't make an entrance like a normal king. A normal king would enter into Jerusalem on a white stallion, a big one. You know, maybe something in the kind of a, a Clydesdale. If I were the king, I would roll in on an impressive ride. You know what I'm picking? I'm picking an Asian elephant. I want to come in impressive. I want when everybody sees me as I roll into town, everybody look up. But when he sent them into the city, he'd ask them, you'll find a, a foal with a, co a colt. Grab them and bring them to me. He's going to ride in on a dinky donkey. Can anybody say oh, underwhelming? I mean, seriously, he rides in on not just a donkey, but a baby donkey, a young donkey. Now, everybody here knows, if, you're, if you've been alive for any length of time, that donkeys are hard to work with. Are you with me? 
They're known for their stubborn will and they can be very unruly. They can be very, very faithful, very, very loving to the right people. But for the most part, when you're putting them to work, they don't like that. So here's Jesus jumping on a little donkey. I mean, it's kind of weird, isn't it? But I want to tell you something. There's a purpose for that. See, I think the Romans would have been expecting a, don a, 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 a stallion and that, that would have piqued their interest. That would have got them looking. But he rode in on a little donkey. And you can see the centurion as well as the soldier looking at Jesus bouncing on that little donkey and with a little bit of a snicker looking at him like, <laughs> wonder who this is and what's the point. But the Jews, the Jews standing on the hill, standing on the mountain, looking over at this procession, coming down that, ger that road, the king's road, up to the city, knew exactly what that meant. I did a little research on my own. And in 1 Kings, the first chapter, when S King David was was getting ready to go home to be with the Lord. He called everybody together and he, he wanted to anoint. He had the high priest anoint Solomon as king. And he said, have Solomon ride on my mule. See, it was the king's ride, the mule. If you remember later on or earlier on when Absalom rose up against his father David, you know what he was riding. He was riding a donkey. He was making a statement, and it's a statement that's been made over and over again through Jewish antiquity. These Jews in Jerusalem knew exactly what he was saying. They knew exactly what this meant. And as a matter of fact, I honestly believe the minute they saw him coming toward the city, they were already plotting to get rid of him. But see, God was fulfilling his promise and he always fulfills his promise. Back up to verse 4. All this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet saying, Tell the daughter of Zion. Now stop right there. That's Isaiah 62 verse 11. Now the, the children of Israel in Jerusalem were always called the daughters of Zion. That was always his bride. Always his expected bride. That's the only part from Isaiah 62, right there. Tell the daughter of Zion. And then, behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Zechariah 9.9. But, you know, there's something curious about Zechariah 9.9 that you theologues, you theo-geeks, Bible geeks might get interested in. And that is there's a couple things missing from this quote that John has left out. And he's, he, it says, Behold, your king is coming. Uh, and it says, Just and having grace. The, Zechariah 9, 9. See if I can find it real quick. I want to read it to you. Because I don't want you to miss it. I'm getting to it. Here it is. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation. Lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Written thousands of years before. A thousand years before. Anyway, he's just. He's bringing justice and salvation. Where this Jesus says he's riding into Jerusalem right now, he's bringing mercy and salvation. He's going to provide the justice, but he's the embodiment of mercy and salvation. The scene itself is a fulfillment of prophecy. From Isaiah to Zechariah, a donkey, a baby donkey. And this is a powerful thing. 
Why would he do that? Why this ridiculous scene? There's more to it. Verse 9. Then the multitude who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of God. Psalm 118 again. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Save now. This is the perfect picture of how the king will come and save. He's entering to rule. But he's also entering to save. But not like kings of this world. Not like leaders in our world. He will not take power and kill. He will relinquish his personal power to save. And he will die in the process. He will rule and save at the same time through his own weakness, through his own death on the cross for our sins. See, he confronts us with that. And he's going to be confronting Rome, the Jews, Galileans, and everybody else. By the way, there's only a couple of different groups of people in this parade. There are Galileans, but then there are all the people who were coming along that road, who watched Jesus and saw what he did. He confronts us with this moment and he confounds us with it. This is the only access to his saving rule. This is the same way he goes in is the same way we do. Admitting our own weakness and acknowledging our sin. Jesus took on our sin and took on our weakness and all we have to do is come to him with the same thing this is exactly why jesus used the words follow me matthew 10 38 matthew 16 24 mark 8 34 luke 9 23 luke 14 27 follow me follow me he always said follow me And the reason he uses that is because nobody ever earns salvation. They receive it. Most people who think that they prayed the right prayer were in the right moment and they invited Jesus into their hearts. Most people who place some sort of moral value to that are missing the point. The point is, Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. And I know that in my own life. I wasn't looking for God at the time, but I got confronted by some Jesus freak. It was so irritating because I was in the middle of probably the worst, some of the worst moments of my life. I cried out for the first time and prayed to God, please, Lord, show me the way because this isn't working. Have you ever prayed that prayer? I have. And I'll never forget the next morning, somebody roused me out of bed. They were on my door, pounding like the police. And if anything will wake a man up, at probably 21 years of age, who's been involved in all kinds of ridiculous things, if anything will wake him up, it will be the cop knock. And it was a cop knock. And I walked to the door, and I looked through the people, and when you know it was a friend of mine. I kept distance from him, but I couldn't not answer the door. I opened up the door and he shared with me, I've been praying for you, Howard. You're living a lie. You're serving the father of lies. When will you ever wake up? That was his message to me. Isn't that a great come forward and come to Jesus message? (laughs) I was thrilled. Oh, really? How then must I be saved? I didn't do any of that. I couldn't get him out of the apartment quick enough. Thanks for sharing. Hey, great to see you again. God bless you. Bye-bye. Get out. But one thing I couldn't do was remove what he said from my brain. And the Lord kept reminding me and kept reminding me. And I realized that my human ability was at best subpar. And the only way I could do it is to admit it. I'm weak. And I'm messed up. See, the most common salvation message, 
at a time like this is this. So your life is a mess. You're steeped in depression. Your girlfriend just told you last night, we can be friends. Now you're in the friend zone. Or your significant other, who that may be, has said, I'm sorry, I, I just don't love you anymore. Or maybe the IRS has come in and, and said they're going to do an audit. Or maybe you came home and on your way home from work, you're looking at the smoke and the rising and thinking, well, there's a fire somewhere until you take a left turn and head down your block and you realize it's your house. Boy, in those moments, they'll come out and say, come to Jesus and he'll fix it. I'm sick. Come to Jesus, you can be healed. I'm broke. Come to Jesus and he'll, he'll fill that bank account. My, my wife left me. Come to Jesus and he'll, he'll fix that marriage for you. I got fired. Come to Jesus. There's a better job in the offing. Jesus, save me from me. Come to Jesus and he'll save you. Lord, come to Jesus and you know what I need. I mean, that's easy. But it's hard when there's really no way out. It's hard when you realize that that storm isn't clearing up anytime soon. That's not the point. You missed the point. Look at verse 9 again. Look at the people in Jerusalem. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name. Hosanna in the highest. Save now. See, they want to be delivered. You know that. There's a foreign nation who's come in and occupied and taken over control and is exercising taxation against the people. They're even grabbing some of the citizenry and making them slaves. They're cruel and heartless and brutal. And they're overwhelming and unstoppable. They are by any stretch of the imagination, a superpower, and they're occupying their real estate. These Italians have come in and ruined Israel. They want God, get this, to deliver them from the Romans. They thought that they had a Rome problem. So they're asking God, save us from Rome. But here's the big problem. Their problem, they are every but, every bit a part of the problem. The reason that Rome's there in the first place had everything to do with them and their problem. If Jesus is going to deal with the Romans, he's got to deal with them too. I mean, they have to come to the place that there is a greater problem and, and it was not a problem but then Rome showed up and Rome wouldn't be the problem if they didn't deal with their problem. And here's the problem. Are you ready? ready. They have a distance problem. <laughs> they have a distance problem. See, what they needed was freedom from the distance with God. See, the distance, in the distance, that's the place where guilt and shame live. That's what lives in the distance. There's, there's no forgiveness in the distance. There's only guilt and shame. So what do we do with guilt and shame? You know as well as I do. What we do is we cover it up or we justify it. We try to play poker with our guilt and our shame. With our weakness. But see, they were missing this completely. All these people. They all missed it. Rome missed it. The Jews missed it. These people in the parade, they were a part of it, but they were really missing it. Look at verse 10. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? You know what? You know what? I looked it up. Seo is the word uh, in Greek. Seo. And what it means is agitated. They were all like, Noi. What now? 
What next? What is this? See, they weren't ready for him. The people who are living in the city, two million people plus, they weren't ready for this. See, Palm Sunday is the perfect contrast between what I want and what I need. Am I talking to anybody? See, most of the time, I'm pretty clear on what I want. Am I talking to anybody here? Are, Are you folks clear on what you want? I mean, I've got my want list down. How about you? I know exactly what I want. You know, when somebody's yelling at me, I want them to shut up. (laughs) When the police are in my rearview mirror and it's Christmas, I want them to get a more important call and thus leave me to go take care of the real criminals out there. I mean, there are so many wants on my want list. I've got a lot of wants. Anybody else? I mean, see, Jesus confronts me, and he confronts you, and he confounds me, because he doesn't give me what I want. He gives me what I need, and what I, when he gives me what I need, I don't think I need it. And when he doesn't give me what I want, I think he's blowing it. See, when he comes, when Jesus comes into your heart and your life, he brings you exactly what you need. And there's a problem in the soul of Israel in this day, at this time. And he was presenting the the answer. And can you imagine living in a time where there is political corruption, there are wars all around you, there is social unrest, where people are just angry, angry, angry. People are feeling lost, exploited. There's all kinds of garbage going. Can you imagine living at a time like that? I mean, I couldn't imagine that. But I want you to take a second in your mind's eye, look at that donkey. That donkey has never been ridden. That donkey is a baby donkey and Jesus is riding in the midst of a crowd that happens to be yelling and throwing down trip hazards every inch of the way think about that and get this if you look at the story the only one really placid here is the donkey people are screaming and yelling Hosanna and the disciples throw their clothes on the donkey's back Jesus is up there I don't know how much he weighs 120 130, 150. The donkey can't be happy. If I were the donkey, I wouldn't be happy. But look at the donkey. The donkey is fine. It's irritating. And when you're a baby donkey, there are a few things worse than having a grown man on your back going downhill with a shouting mob, throwing cloaks and huge palm friends in front of you. I went down that road, by the way. Bedford and I went down that road. We had people with us that went down that road. Do you know it's steep? It's like as you're going down the road, it's steep. I watched people trip on the cobblestones as we were going down that road. And he's on the donkey, the baby donkey. And I'm telling you, homie's leaning back. He's leaning back because gravity is is, is a force to be reckoned with. And the the only one who really gets who Jesus is, is the donkey. (laughs) Think it through. I mean, you can just tell by looking at the donkey. Just look at the donkey. The donkey is probably calmly walking down that steep, sloped road. And she knows that the king is with her. Even a donkey, even if a donkey speaks truth, it's still truth, okay? That's Martin Luther, by the way. Now, I want to remind you of something. Jesus sent for that donkey. He owns everything, yet he asks anyway. There's an invitation for every donkey in this room. He asks anyway. 
Now, Jesus sat on that donkey. Even though the donkey was a foal. Listen, you don't pick a foal donkey to ride on. That's the worst choice. You, t- you pick a young male donkey. Everybody knows they're genetically predisposed for greater strength. Don't need to be smart. Just need to be strong. But Jesus doesn't do that. He picks the worst possible alternative. Give me the fall of the donkey. Number three. Jesus borrowed the donkey. You know what he ended up doing? He ended up giving it back. He only used it for a while. So you had the Romans, the Jews, and the people that saw Lazarus and saw the blind men. The Romans were indifferent. The Jews, they were hardened because they had too much to lose. That, the thought of relinquishing everything to this king was too much. See, they wanted what they wanted. The Galileans, they were filled with hope. I want to read to you from Hebrews, the 13th chapter, verses 5 and 6, from Eugene Peterson's version, The Message. Don't be obsessed with getting more material things. God bless you. Be relaxed with what you have. Since God assured us, I'll never let you down, never walk off and leave you. We can boldly quote, God is there, ready to help. I'm fearless no matter what. Who or what? can get to me bless you I want to do the same thing from Deuteronomy 31 6 from the message be strong take courage don't be intimidated don't give them a second thought because God your God is striding ahead of you he's right there with you he won't let you down and he won't leave you everything that is under Jesus, walks in peace. Three things I want to leave you with because now I'm starving to death. (laughs) And it's right there in verse 6. If you're ready, here we go. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt. Now, uh, number one, do what Jesus tells you. Just do what he says. Jesus leads you and guides you. Do what he tells you to do. Get used to hearing Jesus' voice. Read out of the New Testament. Read what he says. Read and look and study how he responds. And when he tells you to do something, do it. And it can be weird. I mean, I've had him tell me do weird things. Seriously. I'll never forget my buddy Ted. He went home to be with the Lord some you know, probably 10 years ago now. Ted was a computer guy that got laid off and he was trying to find work. He was willing to do anything and he couldn't find work. And he was walking around picking up ca- uh, cans off the side of the road, cans and bottles to take care of his family. And uh, as he was walking down and it was uh, down off of uh, the 76 out by Fallbrook, was not that far off of the main road. His house isn't far off that, the 76. And he was walking uh, along the 76. And he saw this house with a long driveway. It's over there past, I think it's just past the Baptist church there on the 76. And there was a door with a long driveway. There's a door and the door was red. And as he's praying and talking to the Lord, he, he says it was almost audible. The Lord said, go up and knock on that door and say, I'm the man for the job. And he's like, he walked past it. He's like, I'm not one of those. Okay. I'm not one of those. Get a word from God guys. And you know, I'm just going to, so he wasn't, he was conservative. He didn't believe in it. And then he walked back and it struck him again. And he thought to himself, here I am out here picking up cans and I, 
What have I got to lose? I don't have a job. He didn't even have unemployment. So he walks up, you know, sheepishly up the driveway, and he knocks on the door, and a guy comes to the door. The guy's got his sleeves rolled up. He's got glasses perched on his forehead, you know, like they do. And uh, the guy opens the door, and he says, how can I help you? He says, well, I, I think I can help you. My name is Ted, and I'm the man for the job. The guy looks, stops, stunned. He says, you're the man for the job. He says, do you know anything about computers? He said, well, absolutely, that's my field of study. He says, come on in. And he ushers him in to his den, and he's got a table with computers all over it, and him and his partner are trying to figure it out. He says, if you can fix this, you got a job. He looked at it, and within about five minutes, he had it figured out. And guess what? He got a job, but it wasn't just any job. He was making $180,000 a year with this local computer business, simply because he listened to the voice saying, go knock on the door. Is that nuts or what? Let me tell you, if God tells you to do something, do it. And if God tells you to stop doing something, stop. Okay? Next thing. They laid their clothes on them. When I marinated on this, so number one, do what he said, but when I marinated on this, it's just this. Give them what you have. When you, when you have a partner and that partner is a bit of a challenge. Give him what you have. Give him the partner. Give him the problem. When, when you're concerned over your health issues, or there's something going on in your financial issues, give him what you have. Because for most of us, what we have, we don't really have it. It has us. Can I get an amen? Yeah. I mean, we're paying for what we have. Some of us are paying way more than what we actually could have purchased it outright for because we wanted it and we had to have it. And now it has us. Give him what you have. They laid their clothes on them. By the way, that's their identity. That's who they were. And then thirdly and lastly, and they set him on them. In other words... Leave it with him. Not only give it, but don't take it back. Leave it. Leave it. Let it go. Give it to him. And the only ones who really participated in this magic moment, who really didn't get it all, were the disciples. Why? Because they just did what he said. They just gave him what he had. And they just left it all with him. And the rest, as they say, is history. Get this. With every command and with every work that God does, he provides leftovers. He really does. Those are those leftovers that are always warm and ready. And when you're sitting back and you start to get a little long in the tooth, or a little big in the forehead, or a little gray up there, you can look back and enjoy the meals that he served you throughout the years. And Lucia and I sat back the other day and just remembered those moments in our lives where they were the most white-knuckle moments, and we remembered how God provided for us. So, yeah. Do what he says, give him what you have, and then leave it with him, and you're going to be fine. This is Passover week. You realize that you're putting God on display when you go to work, when you raise your kids, when you get married. In all that you do, you're putting him on display. Just be the dinky donkey that you've always been. Take it from another dinky donkey. 
you and I are going to be fine just as long as Jesus, Jesus is in control of the ride. Let's pray. Father, this morning, I think for so many of us, we agonize about so many different things. About phone calls. About posts on the internet. About what's swirling around us politically or economically. Lord, we're all facing different things. Like scary diagnosis to enemies that surround us. And Lord, into the middle of this picture rides Jesus right there in plain sight. God, I pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart to be moved by you. That when you speak, we would listen and we would respond and we would use what we have. We could give it to you and see what you can do with it. Lord, thank you for entering our world and taking on the same things that we have to deal with. And Lord, I pray that each and every one of us would be looking for your answer. Not your answer for what we want, but your answer to provide what we need. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's eat.